And the result of this, the prize at the end of the day, are stickers. Unfortunately, they are the world's smallest stickers. <laughs> Where I think we got some metric system versus the English metric system. So instead of like centimeter, uh, uh, inches, they are centimeters and millimeters. But that's OK, because I think everybody's laptop has way too many stickers on it. And now you can put stickers on your phone. <laughs> and so at the end of it, you can grab handfuls of them, because I've got hundreds of them, because they were supposed to be bigger. And if you want a sticker at the end, one that covers up, say, if you have an Apple logo on yours, it lights up. You get the Visual Studio Family sticker on the back of that. So that's the goal. We're going to get our stickers into the cloud. So let's get going on that. Uh, Seven is my machine. OK, so I'm just going to give you a, a sort of a, a bit of an overview of what we're, in, what, what we're using today, and then we'll get right into it. So I'm using the Insiders build. Who here uses the Insiders build? A small handful of you. That's OK. So the Insiders build comes out every single night. It's what we use to build VS Code. So we're going to use that. It's always on the cutting edge. It sounds like, oh my god, it's going to be every night. It's going to be crashing. It works all the time, because if it stops for us, then we fix it. And the cool thing about it is, since we have half our engineering team in Switzerland and half our engineering team in Redmond, we have 24-hour coverage, basically. So if somebody breaks it someplace and somebody gets up on the other side of the world, they fix it and everything works wonderfully. So we're going to uh, use the Insiders release. Um, so this is what I've got. One thing I want to sure go through is just a couple of settings I have. And I can hit Command, Comma, and I'll bring up my settings file. And we're doing a lot of work on our settings UI. And uh, we've kind of come into this sort of half designer, half editor space. We want to make everything an editor. Um, but a few things that I have turned on in my uh, instance here. I've got autosave after a delay. Um, it's kind of like if you're on the web, everything's just saved live. You can turn on autosave. That's what I do. Uh, font ligatures. And so what font ligatures are is if you say something like triple equals, you get this really cool uh, font. And if you say like, you know, fat arrow, oops, equals arrow, you get a really cool one. So it looks nice. So you'll see that if you're kind of going, what the heck is that? Um, extensions, auto-update. So if you've got extensions and you're always getting that badge and the badge drives you nuts, turn on auto-update. We'll auto-update it every time for you. Uh, Docker extension, we'll show that later. Uh, let's see, what else is good in here? Update channel. So if you are on the Insider's release and you don't want to get updated every day, you can turn off how often you get updated. And since we're doing a demo, I said I don't want any updates. So I'm on the update channel none, so I won't get prompted. Uh, workbench tips enabled. I don't know if anybody has ever seen this, but um, at one point we released uh, an instance or, or VS Code where it had key bindings on the desktop. And you can actually turn those off if you don't want to see them. One of the guys in Switzerland didn't want to see those, so he added a setting that can turn that off, which is cool. Um, and then workbench color customization. So I'm using the dark theme, but recently what we did was we enabled you to basically set the um, color for just about everything in the workbench itself, right? So if you do a control space in here, you have full access to, uh, to all of the colors in the UI. And so, so one of the things you'll notice here, like my tab active background, which is this bluish color, like we could come in here and say, you know, uh, let me copy that because I love that color, two, 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 whatever that one is. And it's black and it changes to black. All right, so those are kind of some of the cool settings that I've got. Uh, set up here that we'll be using. From an extensions perspective, I'll, I've only got a couple, or three, I should say. NPM, which is uh, a nice little extension which lets you sort of right-click and install NPM modules. Open folders, the guy that wrote this is a genius. Um, but what you can do is basically come over here and right-click on a folder and say, you know, open a new workbench here. And so it'll just go and open it. Go, go download that. Drive up my numbers. Um, and then VS Code MongoDB, which is a very, very early instance of an extension. It's not loaded yet, and I'll show you more about, about that in a minute. All right, so our application I talked about, it's a stickers app. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to press F5. So I say, what kind of app is this? It's a Node.js application. We'll spin it up. Is the size, can everybody see OK? Is it zoomed in enough? I can go out, in, good, ugly, no? All right, we'll leave it like that. Um, so the app is uh, running on localhost 3000. We'll browse, oops, sorry, I had a breakpoint there. I don't want a breakpoint yet. We're in run. We come back over here. Localhost. Hey, come on, this is the easiest part of the demo. There it is, okay. So, oh no, what are you doing? One second. You know, you reset the demo too early on, and let me see, oh, hold on one second. 
It's only going to take a second. It's going to be easy. Okay, bump, bump, bump. Hmm. Hmm. Why is that doing that? That just does not seem right. Okay. That's good because you're not running. This is the good way to start the whole demo, is just to like have your first F5 not even work. Huh. Interesting. All right. It says hello from VS Code. It's not supposed to say that yet, but that's okay. So the app is there. It's running, right? So, um, uh, yeah, that's a little bit weird, but we'll figure it out as we go. So that's the app, right? But you saw it's running. It doesn't have any data or anything in it yet, and this is the thing we're going to go and, and build. Um, the first thing I want to talk about, I, I mentioned, is we're going to do some editing. And so one of the things that we've got um, in here, this is a React application. It's node-based. Um, it's got a server component. It's got the client component. Um, it builds using gulp files. So it's just your standard uh, MERN app. It could be a mean app. You could be doing Angular. It's, it's kind of all, all works the same in what we're going to cover here. Um, so I've got a view in here. This is a, a React component. It's called uh, hello view. And so hello from VS Code. And we're going to make sure that this actually works. So we're going to say hello from build 2017. And there'll be five exclamation points. So we know that it's, that's actually there. Um, and let's go over here to browse container, which is just a container that I've got in my, um, in my app. And one of the things that I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn on something called, um, uh, uh, it's, well, it's type checking for plain, plain old JavaScript. So I don't know if everybody knows this, but for JavaScript, for the language service that we use, it provides IntelliSense and all that stuff, we actually use the TypeScript compiler. And the TypeScript compiler has introduced a new feature called uh, type checking for uh, JavaScript. So what I can do is come in here and I can say TS check. And when I do that, I'm basically saying, hey, TypeScript, please check my plain old JavaScript. And um, I can do it on a per file basis, which is what I'm doing here. And as I scroll down here, you can see nothing really happened, which is good. So I have a pretty clean file. Um, everybody thinks, oh, JavaScript, type checking. Do I need type checking? I should use TypeScript. I don't want type checking in JavaScript. That's why I'm using JavaScript. So you can go as far as you want with it. But what happens is when we sort of start to do type checking and more type che checking, the tool can do more stuff for, for us, which is really important. So I can come in here, and I can say, you know, hello, view. And once I start to use that, um, that view, you see I get a squiggle on it. If I press F8, it says, can't find the name hello, view, right? Because I haven't, I haven't got it yet. But I'm also getting a light bulb over here on the left-hand side. And if I press command dot, Actually, we get a pop-up menu, and it says, hey, you know what? I can actually import hello view for you uh, from that file and bring it in, right? Because we understand what the type system is uh, across all the files in, in the workspace. So that's pretty cool. I can do that. Um, if I come in here and I say I want to create a constructor because uh, I want to take some state, and I do this. Oops. And I get another error, right? It says, hey, you know what? Constructors for drive classes must contain a super call. So I can do the same thing. I do command dot, add the missing super call. Right? So then what I can do with the compiler once I turn on type checking is I can let the tool sort of start to do more work for me. Now, I can get even fancier with this. I mean, you can go, you can go pretty far. You can, um, you can start to set uh, uh, types across your entire workspace, and then IntelliSense and things will pick it up. So if I do something in here and I say, like, var, uh, var x equals string, now we know it's a string, and I say x equals 10, and what will happen is if I press F8, I can see 10 is not assignable to a type string. And this is funny because all the other demos I've ever done in VS Code have done the opposite. So now we can figure out that it's a string or a number, which is wonderful. But now you can say, hey, I want this thing to be a string. But if you really want it to be like a number, I mean a Boolean, you can say, you know, uh, you can use a JS doc comment and say type. And I say, actually, this thing is supposed to be a Boolean. Now you're telling the compiler, that actually, X, the thing on the following line is going to be a Boolean. And if I do, I look at the error now, it says, all right, now string, you can't come. Uh, assign that to a Boolean. So you have a lot of control over what you can do uh, with type checking in the editor. And um, again, what it really does is it starts to drive uh, the tool to be able to do more things for you. Now, we've done this on a, on a single file. You can turn it on for the uh, entire workspace if you want through a setting. Um, or you can do something uh, with a file called jsconfig. Now, jsconfig, it, so you can turn it on for a subset of the workspace using a jsconfig JSON file. JSConfig is essentially like TSConfig if you're using TypeScript. It defines what the scope of the project is. And so I've got one here on the client side. I'm saying, yeah, we're using React. And I can go in here and say, all right, I want to do um, turn on type checking across this entire folder. 
And what I want to do is say where I want us to do type checking. So I can say include, and then all I have to do is provide a, uh, a glob pattern for the folders. So I can say, what is it, source, source, uh, any JavaScript file, all right? And what's interesting about this is we have validation on, uh, on the JS uh, config file. And so if I do something like come in here and I you know, make a bad path, you'll see we'll get a little squiggly up here in a second. It'll come up, come on. Come on, squiggly. Hmm. All right, well, I don't know why you're not doing that. Oh, there it is, see the squiggly? It says, hey, it can't find any input. So I set an includes path, but it couldn't find any files in that, so it's not gonna work. So you get some nice type check and validation in here. And so now what we can do is basically say, for any file that's found in source, I want you to stop, start type checking that. That means I can get rid of these, these at TypeScript uh, check commands. And as I move from file to file, if it finds any errors, it'll, it'll, um, it'll surface, the, surface those for me. So that's cool from a TypeScript compiler perspective. And the same thing works in jo uh, types, uh, sorry, a TypeScript compiler for JavaScript perspective. Same thing will work in TypeScript for, um, for you there as well. Um, but you'll notice another thing that kind of happened in here. Um, I import the hello view, but I'm using, it imports or inserts the line with double quotes. And you can see from my pattern, I want to use single quotes. So there's a couple ways I could fix this. Um, I could come in here and I could press Command D, and Command D will actually, let me do that again. Uh, Command D will actually, for every selection of that particular string, it'll add another cursor to it, right? So now I have two cursor sets. It means I can go do like things like this. So it's a very cool way. It's my new favorite key binding that I found. Um, so I can go and I can change it that way, but you know, I would actually rather use a linter. And so we have a, um, a bunch of extensions and like really for any problem that you need, go look in the, ex that you have, go look for extensions and you'll probably find a solution for it. So there's an extension out there called ESLint. It's a very popular extension. Um, if we expand this a little bit, you can see it's got almost a million downloads. So we'll install that. We'll quickly reload uh, VS Code. And what it's going to do is come in here into uh, the workspace and see there's an ESLint resource file. And uh, it's going to use that to you know, understand the rules on how to lint my code. And one thing that's interesting is we're actually using a plugin to ESLint saying that we're actually working React. So I can comment that plugin out. Um, other things you can see in here, you know, I can get warnings and errors, but if I have complicated rules, I can pass them in as an array. So once I do all this, if I come back over here to my browse container, you can see now with ESLint, I've got, you know, single quotes, uh, or should be using single quotes, and again, I get a code action, I can command dot, and I can fix that problem, and it'll fix it for me. So the tool is starting to learn how to do more things for you through linters and through the compiler. And you can see I have lots of warnings in here now, I'll say, hey, uh, you know, header view is, not defi is defined but never used, but we are using it down here. And it doesn't understand that this is a React component. And of course, since we were over here in uh, ESLint uh, RC and I uncommented the plugin, it doesn't understand it. If we put the plugin back in so it uses the React plugin, uh, we come back here, all of our warnings are gone because we're actually using header view down in, uh, in, our, in our view. All right, so there's a couple of quick tips for uh, configuring the editor, for linting, uh, for type, to, uh, for type um, um, checking uh, using um, TypeScript. Okay, so now what we want to do is we've, we've got it out. We're kind of happy with how this thing is running. Um, what I want to do now is let's go run the app again because we added the hello view uh, to it. We're going to run it again, port 3000. Localhost 3000, it still says hello from VS Code. Seems to me there's something running somewhere which is really driving me a little bit nuts. Um, hmm. I know what we can do. Let's do something slightly different. We're gonna listen on a different port. That'll fix everything. Uh, 3000, port 3000, we're gonna listen on 3000. Five. Let's see if we get that right. Read me, config, port 3000. We'll do 3005 here. And let's run this again. Port 3005. Localhost 3005. Hmm. That is really, really strange. <laughs> All right. Oh, 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 perfect segue into the next section. I know why it's not working. Do you know why it's not working? It's a React component. 
We need some sort of a build, a client-side build. What I've got in my folder is a build from when I was practicing about an hour ago. Ah, oh, that's driving me nuts. All right, um, let me go and change that back to 3,000. No. Oh. Get back, change that. 3,000. Okay, what we're going to do, um, remember I said that this uses a gulp file uh, to do all of its builds, and here's the gulp file. And there's one in here called build. And one of the things I can do is I can come in here and press command pre P, bring up the command palette, I can type in task. And what task is, it's basically a built-in way to run tasks throughout your environment. And what's cool about this is, you know, we think about VS Code as sort of a lightweight uh, tool that sort of strings a lot of tools together, and tasks are the way that it can happen. So if I run build here, what this will do is basically run the gulp task uh, to build the app for me. It'll lint for me as well, I think. Oh no, that's the full build, we'll do the linting. And now, um, once this is finishes up, and I can press F5 again to run it, and we go and we load up localhost 3000. There we go. That really made, so, okay, so everybody get that? We're good? All right. Whew. That helps quite a bit. Now, but that points out a problem, right? So we have to build this every time um, in order to uh, get the right results out of it. But when I'm doing my debugging, um, there is no configuration. I didn't define how this, this app should be run. VS Code is just figuring it out for me. But what we can do is we can be a little bit more specific. And what we could do is create this thing called a launch.json. A launch.json will tell VS Code how to run the app. And by default, it goes and it figures out from uh, package.json that should run server uh, index.js. Uh, but what we wanted to do is actually come in here before it runs, run what we call a pre launch task, which is build. All right, so once we do that and we press F5, you'll see the output, the build will happen. And then when the, the server comes up, and we see it over here in the console, and the server comes up, you know, we're at localhost 3000. So everything is good there. So what we can do is we can say, hey, you know what, just run this app as it is, or I can start to configure how this app should actually, um, should actually work. So that's pretty cool, right? So I've got this, I can configure it, I can get my build working. But one of the things we noticed is we didn't actually have any data um, in that particular, the app that's running. And when we look through the tasks again, tasks, task, press space, and we scroll through them, there's actually a task in, um, in the Gulf file that will populate a Mongo, a local MongoDB for me. Um, but one of the things I could do is actually figure out sort of what's going on there, collapse this down, we'll go to the Gulp file, and here's the populate MongoDB task. I can set a breakpoint here. Now this isn't my app, this is a, a file, a JavaScript file, node file which is next to my app, but I want to run and, and debug that. So we can go back to the debug configuration, um, and we can say down here in this big, it's a button, it might just look like a label, um, but I can say, hey, here's all the different kinds of configurations I want to do, and so we can say one here, a gulp task. So we'll insert the scaffolding for the gulp task, we'll say we want to run populate MongoDB, right, which is just the, the label. It knows to go and run gulp out of the node modules folder, and if I spell it correctly, um, it'll run that particular task. So now all I have to do is come over here to debugging and say, hey, I'd like to run that particular setting. I hit play, and what'll happen is it'll break over in my gulp file. So my app's not running. I'm debugging basically a single file in here. And of course, I can step across this. I can step into it, um, and I can see that, you know, initial data is, you know, a bunch of objects that'll get put into the database for me. That's cool. I'll press play. It'll run. We can stop that. If we go back here and we launch our application again, we press play, it'll build again. Um, and then when the server comes up, we say localhost 3000. Give it a second for it to come up. Yep, yeah, now it's running localhost 3000. Boom, now we have data in our application because we were able to run that, that gulp file. So that's how you can configure a single file, which is pretty cool. Um, but imagine, you know, so far what we've been doing is, is debugging the server. Now imagine you want to actually debug the client side, which is uh, another task that you can do. There's another extension for that, which is called the Chrome Debuggers. Chrome, Chrome, debug. And uh, that is a very, very popular extension. It's got 1.6 million installs, so we'll install that one. And what this basically does is let you do both client side, uh, it lets you do client side debugging in VS Code itself instead of having to use 
uh, browser tools. So again, the same model that we do, we can come over here, we can add a configuration, which now there's a new one in here because we added a new debugger to uh, VS Code. And we'll say we're going to launch Chrome, and the site or, that we've been going to is 3000. And in this case, we need to start up the server first. So I'll just come in here into the terminal, say npm start, which is another way for us to start the server. So it's listening on, on 3000 now. And what we can do is then go open up some code on the client side. Um, and it's using Webpack. It's creating, um, it's creating uh, map files, which the Chrome debugger will pick up. We'll put a breakpoint over here in our render method. And when we go and run now, we'll start, oops, we'll launch Chrome. And what this will do is we'll start up a new debug instance of Chrome, and it hits our breakpoint. So now what we're doing is basically um, debugging the client side of our application, no longer debugging the server side. But that's kind of a bummer that we had to actually start the server um, uh, from the terminal in order to get that to work. So there's another configuration that we can do. This is the one that's the most cool. Let me close this down. We can actually set it up so that we can debug both the client and the server at the same time. Right? You would think you would only get this in large IDEs, but you can actually do this with the editor. And so what you do here is you come in, and there's a new top-level um, object, and it's called compounds. And all you have to do is say, all right, name the compound, we'll say client server, and I tell it which configurations I actually want to run. So we'll do launch Chrome, and the other one is launch program, I think it's called. Let's scroll down here. Launch program. Okay, so what will happen when I run this one, it'll start the server, it'll do the build, it'll run, and then it'll also uh, launch the client. So then we can go client server, press run. You'll see the build will happen. We'll wait for the debug, uh, the server to start up here, say 3000, come on. And while that's happening, let me go and find a browse and a root. We'll put in a breakpoint here. I think we still have a breakpoint over in uh, the client side, and now we'll refresh this page, and boom. Now we're stopped in the server. If we hit run, and refresh the page one more time, now we're stopped in the client. So now what we can do is debug both sides of it. Yes, question? Yeah, um, when you make a compound like that, can you specify dependencies between them so that, say, you first uh, launch program and then run the browser and actually visit the page once it's done? No, this, so the question is, can you create um, connections between the two uh, debug tasks uh, in the compound debug configuration? No, you can't. But what you could do is create like a pre-launch task in a gulp file that could do both of those things for you. But it's a, good, it's a good request, but you can't do that today. All right, and so the other interesting thing about this is uh, up here in the, in the debug toolbar, you can actually choose uh, between which one that you want to have control. So we're in the... Uh, the, the server side, which we're not broken in, so it's running, so I don't have step in, step over. And the client side, since we're broken, you can see that I've got those controls available. So that's how we can go and set up debugging for both client and server in, in the tool. Um, okay, so one thing that's, that's going on here is um, we've got, let me just go and run the application one more time. So we'll launch the app. I'm going to go back to 3000. Come on. Ah, that build step always takes time. Go away. All right, so here's our set of stickers. We've got data in the database, but one of the problems is that there's no VS Code sticker in there. There's no little, tiny, itty-bitty sticker in there. And what we want to do is actually get, uh, get our, our, our sticker in the store. So how can we go and do that? Now, what I mentioned before is that uh, one of the extensions that we have installed here is this extension called VS Code MongoDB. Now, this is an extension that is in uh, super early preview. It's something that we're working on right now. Um, but what's interesting about it is it's using some uh, what we call provisional or proposed APIs. And these are APIs that are not, um, and let me just get to this folder, sticker, sticker app, and make that a little bit bigger, um, code. Just get the help up there. Um, so what this extension is doing is using something called the proposed API. So this is a, uh, an extensibility point in VS Code, which is not public. It's not finalized. We're not ready to support it yet. We're still working on it. It's available only in the insider's releases. And so what we wanted to do was say, hey, you know what? 
we'll continue to work in this API. We want people to be able to create extensions using the API, and we want to get feedback on it. But what we don't want is people publishing extensions that are using proposed APIs, and then they break. And so we make it so that you, uh, as the user of an extension with that uh, API, that you have to be deliberate to say, hey, I really want to use this. And so I have it installed, but it doesn't load until I come in here and I say, code, oh, this is the thing that I ran before. You know, if you do code or code insiders h, there's a whole set of command line options that you can run, which is pretty cool. What I can do is say code insiders, and I want to say that um, I want to enable proposed posed API, and then I have to give it the extension, and it's called msvscode.vscode-mongodb, and then I want to load up this particular folder. So I'm saying, hey, I know what I'm doing. Please load that extension for me. And once you see uh, the uh, environment load back up, you can see that we've got a new sash or session over here in the Explorer. And that's what this proposed API is doing, is it's actually contributing a new Explorer, a new tree into the Explorer inside VS Code itself. And so there's a bunch of work that we have to do to make that a publicly consumable um, API, but you can start to get a sense of how that can work. And of course, you can slide it around, do everything you expect. It's a familiar model, so if you're familiar with the debug uh, section, it's the same sort of sash that bounces around, and you can use it there. And so we think that that's a, a cool way to start to extend the, uh, that part of the UI as well. So you can see I've already got a connection to localhost, uh, my local Mongo database, and the get stickers demo. And what I can do is I can say, uh, Mongo, uh, connect to the database. It'll show me all the databases that we have. You can see in the tree. It will connect to the get stickers demo. So that's cool. Now my extension is connected to that, and I want to work with it. So what I can do is come in here on the toolbar and say, create a new scrapbook. Um, and what the idea is here is that you know, when you're working with these CLIs, you kind of start to build up a whole set of commands that you're running, and you want to tweak them before you actually go and commit them. And so this is the same thing with Mongo. So I can come in here, and I can say db dot. And then, of course, with VS Code, you get a rich um, uh, IntelliSense experience. So I can see stickers is in my list. And if I say find, and I hit command tick, what will happen is we'll actually run that command. You can see over on the right-hand side, those are all the records that are in the database formatted prettily um, as BSUN. But what we can do is we can come in here, and we're going to replace one of these. We'll just use Trello. I love Trello, but we're going to replace Trello. So we'll say tooling. Uh, we'll put the VS Code, VS Code, and we'll say you know VS Code rocks, VS Code rocks. Author is Microsoft, and the most important thing we're going to point at the VS Code image. And now I can just right click on this document and say update, and we'll go update the document itself. All right, I don't need to save that anymore, but if we come back over here to our app and we run it again, I'm going to take that pre-launch task out. <laughs> Let's take that out. We don't need that anymore. It'll quick speed things up. Boom, boom, boom. And now if we look over here, go to localhost, boom. Our sticker is now in the database. So I can use this Mongo extension the same way that I'm, you know, editing other files. I can sort of start to work and get the inner loop flow down. I can you know, run queries, do all sorts of interesting things. So that's pretty cool. So now we've accomplished step one. We've got uh, our sticker into the database for our sticker app. And what do we want to do next with this? I think the thing that we want to do next is to get this thing up into the cloud. Yes, because we're halfway through our time. Now would be a good time to start putting things up into the cloud. So how are we going to do that? And there's a ton of different ways to go and deploy things uh, to the cloud. Uh, one way that you can do is you can deploy loose files, right? So you could use Git. You could set up uh, a deployment uh, directly to an Azure app service. You could do it through a Git repository. Um, one of the things that I, and I feel bad about this, in the blurb for this session, it said that we were going to set up a continuous pipeline using VSTS. And, um, you can set up a continuous pipeline using VSTS using loose files at this point through the CLI, but you can't set it up using a container yet. So I apologize, we're not going to cover that right now, but container deployment through a CI CD pipeline is coming very soon in the Azure CLI. That said, um, what I want to actually do is, like I said in the beginning of this, is I want to use containers. The reason I want to use containers is because they're very portable. They can run locally on my machine, they can run in the cloud, I can distribute them. You could take and you can run the exact same bits that I have. So let's go and take a look at what it takes to take this application and containerize it. So let me just go and close a few things here. Um, uh, scrapbook, I don't need that scrapbook. I'm going to come in here. We'll close that down for now. 
And I'm going to create a new file. We'll call it a Docker file, which will define our build. And one of the things we do in VS Code is we say, hey, you know what? We know about a certain set of extensions which, you think, which we think you should go and use. And one of them is the Docker extension. The other thing is it's, it's dynamic. It kind of says, hey, what are the things that you're doing in your workspace? Like, I know it's like a node app, and we're going to go and recommend other things like you know, CSS, HTML formatter, or JS hint, or markdown lint. Um, but the Docker extension is the one that we want to go and grab. So we'll just click on that and install it. This will quickly reload. And once we've got that, I've got a whole set of Docker commands in here. So we say Docker add files to the workspace. It's a node app, and it's listening on port 3000, as we saw before. And it'll go and create. Uh, the Docker file, a Docker Compose, and a Docker Compose debug file for me. Now, here's the Docker file. This is pretty standard Docker files, was kind of in practice today, um, but it's already out of date because we're doing containers and Node and good things like that. Um, what Docker has introduced in uh, 1703, I think, I can't remember exact number, um, is this notion of multi stage builds. So, what I'm going to do is I've got one over here already written, and I'm going to bring that one in. This is a multi stage build file. I'm going to tell uh, VS Code that this is a Docker file. And because it doesn't have a Docker file extension, it's kind of hard to tell. Actually, what you can do is you can come in here and you can say, configure file association so that it always says that this is a Docker file. And we'll say it's Docker. And that'll write a setting out to my settings file. So whenever I open this file, it'll be uh, shown as a Docker file. I'm going to kick off the Docker build on this. We'll say Docker build image, uh, the multi stage build file. We'll call it sticker app latest. That's the name of the image that will get created. And while that's happening, let me just talk a second about what's going on here, because I think this is pretty important. So if you're familiar with Docker at all, like the standard Docker file basically you know, starts top to bottom. Here's the base image, copies a bunch of stuff in, does some work, says what the directory is, exposes a port, and then the, the, the command to run when you run that particular image. The problem with this is that for this particular app, you know. Part of what we need to do is we need to do a build when we create this thing. And so you know, there's lots of ways you can do it. I could come in here and I could run just not production. I could come in here and I could say run you know, whatever the path is to gulp and do all that stuff. But then I'm going to end up with an image that has all of my dev dependencies in it, gulp, stuff that I just don't need. What a multi-stage build file does is it lets me sort of build intermediate stages or build images, intermediate images, and then pull things from that. So what we're going to do here in this build, which is running in the background, is we're going to say our base image is from this mHeart Alpine Node 6. It's a very small node um, image. The only thing we're going to do in that is we're going to create a folder called user source app, and we're going to copy in package.json from the local file system. Right? So that's our base image, about as simple as you can get. And then we're going to build another image that is based on that, that one that we did. We're going to call it dependencies. Right? So we're building a new intermediate image called dependencies. And in that, we're going to configure NPM. And we're going to install just our production node modules, right? Because in the end of the day, that's the only thing that we want. And so once we do that, all we do is we copy off node modules to some folder. We squirrel it away. We say, hey, put it in prod node modules. You can name it whatever you want, some unique folder. You're just putting it someplace in this dependencies image. And so then after that, we run npm install again, which will install all of the dependencies. So gulp everything I need at, at design time. And that becomes my dependencies image. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a new image. It's based on dependencies. And dependencies has all of my design time node modules in it. And from there, I'm going to bring the app in. I'm going to run gulp, because I know that's in there. And then I'm going to squirrel away the bits that I have to go and build. Remember the same set of bits that we built locally, because I was getting the wrong hello view at the beginning? We're going to squirrel those away. We're going to say, hey, those are my production bits. Put those in another place. And once that's done, I'm going to build my release image. And I'm going to start with that base, which is the Alpine node that has nothing in it except my folder and uh, package.json. I'll copy in my server code from, the, from my machine, my client code, a pug, or um, whatever it was called before, template. Um, and then I'm going to go and grab those production node modules. And I'm going to grab the production uh, client bits. I'm going to copy those on top of it. And normally, you know, do 3,000 npm start. And what happens is at the end of the day, if I come in here and I say Docker images, you can see that my sticker app is really, it's only 102 meg. So it's very small. Right? It's just the, the most minimal thing that we need to get this app running. So it's a much more interesting way to, to build an app. Now, it, the Docker extension that we have today does not automatically generate one of these multi-stage uh, build files yet, because it's still in beta in Docker. So we're going to wait and try to time it in that way. 
Um, but you can go find them on the internet. It's, it's a very cool thing. So now we've got our image, and um, uh, what we can do is we can run it. And what we'll do is use Docker Compose. We'll use our debug version because we'll, we'll do some more stuff after that. And this is the default Docker Compose um, file that gets created by the extension. And what it does is basically, it, it's, it's really a shortcut way to, um, if you have multiple images, you can string together multiple images. Uh, and it's also, if you have a single image, it's a really simple way to basically do a run and expose some ports. And if you want to do some volume mapping, you can do that too. The reason that the extension does a volume mapping is that you could also create an image where you, you have the image which has all your runtime in it, and you can map in your source code underneath, and you could say run nodemon inside that container, edit your files locally, and it'll keep running up in the container because it's mapped in. But we're not doing any of that, so we don't need that. So what we'll do is we'll run sticker uh, app latest. We'll expose port 3000. We'll also expose the debug port 5000. And we're going to override the startup command. We're going to say run uh, debug 5858. Um, so we're going to go and we'll say docker compose docker compose up. We'll pick the debug one. You can see it spins up. Our app is running. It's listening on port 3000 again localhost 3000, and now it's actually talking to the container, not the node instance that's running on my machine. And again, we don't have any data, right? Because the app is looking for either the localhost, which it has no access to. Like the container has no access to localhost. You could do it, but it's a lot of gyrations. Um, the other thing you can do is the app will listen for an environment variable, a MongoDB URL, right? And so I can show you what that looks like here. Let's go find it in the app. MongoDB URL. And so what the app does on startup, it says, hey, you know, if there's an environment variable called MongoDB URL, if you pass in the connection string, use that. Otherwise, try to, try to connect to localhost, basically what the code is. But we never told, uh, let me bring that thing down, Docker compose down. That'll bring the down. What we never did is we never told, uh, where is it? Compose, Docker compose debug. We never told or we never passed in an environment variable for, for a Mongo database. Um, so what we can say is MongoDB URL, URL, and we can pass in a connection string. Like I said, you can't, from a container, easily talk to the, the local machine or the host. You don't want to do that because it becomes host dependent at that point. You want to talk to some MongoDB somewhere. So we need a MongoDB. And what better place to find a MongoDB is with Cosmo, Cosmos, CosmoDB, whatever we just named it, <laughs> they're going to kill me, um, but DocumentDB up in Azure. And I just happen to have one of those available. So let me go over here into the terminal. I'm going to run the a Azure command line. So az DocumentDB uh, help, uh, what is it, list connection strings, list connection strings. And I can give the name is sticker. I just know this off the top of my hat. Uh, sticker app, MongoDB. And I know that it is in the resource group sticker app RG. What was I missing? Oh. It'd be nice if I had a very good, rich editing experience for that. Um, but here it is. So I've got this Mongo. It's already running up in the cloud. I can go grab this connection string, copy it, and we'll paste that in here. We'll say, all right, there is my connection string. Now, if we bring this up again, we say document, uh, docker compose up, run it. Let me go back over here to the cloud, localhost 3000. There's still no data. Why is that? Because there's no data in the database. So what we can do is come back over here and to our uh, MongoDB extension that we had earlier, and we can connect to that database. So we'll just use the same connection string, and now we're connected to the uh, DocDB, the MongoDB uh, in the cloud. So should, if you saw the keynote earlier, uh, with CosmoDB or DocumentDB, when you create one, you can have a, a different set of APIs that are on top of it. And when I created this one, I said that the kind of it was a MongoDB, which means it basically has a MongoDB compatible API on it. So any Mongo tools can work against it. So I can come in here and I can say create a database. And in this app, it's called the get stickers demo database. And the collection name is called stickers. I just know that off the top of my head. And then you can see now that we've, we've um, 
we've connected to it. I can open up another scrapbook and we can come in here and say db.stickers.find. DB and as expected, there's no data in there. Well, what if we came over here to our local host, we right click on that, we say connect. And now we're connected, you can see down in the, the, the status bar, we're connected to the local host. We run find there and we've got all our documents. So I can just copy these. I can connect back over to my uh, cloud one, connect to that. And then I can come in here and just say db.stickers.insert many. Paste that in. And then we run that, execute script, boom, put a bunch of stickers in the database in the cloud. And if I refresh this page, there we go. All right, so now I've got this container that's running locally. I moved all the data to the cloud and it's running happily in a Mongo database. I've done sort of all still from the editor, just sort of rich editing experience. So this is cool. We've got half of our app up in the cloud. Now we want to get the rest of the app, the actual app itself up in the cloud. Let's see what that looks like. So I'll close this down. We're going to bring down the Docker instance, compose down. And once that's done, what we're going to do is we're going to do something called tagging. So we'll say Docker uh, tag, tag our image. I'll say, which one do you want to tag? So what this is is basically what we're saying is, I've got an image on my machine. It's called sticker app colon latest. And I want to give it a new name. And the name is Chris Dias slash sticker app colon latest. And it figured out it's Chris Dias because as we saw in the beginning, I had some settings that were set up for my Docker extension. Are, they persist in the settings file even though I uninstalled a, uh, an extension. And so when I specify Chris Dias slash sticker app, what I'm doing is I'm saying use the Chris Dias account at Docker Hub when you're pushing this. It's by default, Docker commands will push to Docker Hub. So I'm going to rename it to sticker app, uh, Chris Dias sticker app. And then what I can do is say Docker push. And I'll choose that one. And what will happen is this will go and it will push it up to Docker Hub. And hopefully this will go fairly quickly, which is good. All right, so now we've got our data in the cloud in a Mongo database. We've got the image that we were running locally in our container is now sitting in Docker Hub waiting to be um, deployed somewhere. So we need some place to deploy it. And another great place for that would be Azure. So we saw sort of my Azure command line editing experience a little bit earlier. Um, of course, with VS Code, we say AZ CLI. Oh, no. Azure CLI. We've got an extension for that, because we've got an extension for everything. Um, and this is a new extension. We just actually released it yesterday. Let me close a few of these things down. Don't save. Um, this is a new extension. We actually released it yesterday. And what it does is it gives you a rich editing experience, another scrapbook or notebook type experience uh, for doing Azure CLI. So I can reload the environment. And what I'm going to do is come over here into the workspace. And we'll create a new file. We're just going to call it deploy .azcli. We had to come up with a file extension, and we decided azcli was a good one. So now what I can do is I can come in here and say az account, uh, what is it, set subscription. It's always the first thing you want to do is make sure that you're using the right subscription. And what it's doing is it's actually giving me IntelliSense against all the subscriptions, because I'm already logged in to the Azure CLI. It gives me IntelliSense for all of my subscriptions up in Azure. So I can say, hey, you know what? I want to use my MSCN subscription. Hopefully I've got some money on there. And I can press Command tick, and it'll run that uh, for me. So that's cool. I've got my account set up. Now we need to go and create a resource group. Um, AZ group, uh, create name, uh, sticker app, RG, and we'll say the location where we want it to be done, like West US, and it'll give me IntelliSense against all the regions. Uh, so that's pretty cool. So I can, I can quickly do that. We run that command. And I get back a nice piece of uh, a JSON. If I wanted to run it and see what that was, I can hold down Shift Command Tick. And this will actually, like we saw with the Mongo extension, bring it up in another editor. It's just plain JSON. I can start to do things on top of my JSON. If I want to query it using James Path, I can do that. I can copy paste. All sorts of goodness can happen with that. Um, the other thing I want to do here is I want to say AZ configure uh, set defaults. defaults. And what AZ configure defaults lets you do is say, uh, I don't want to type in the resource group every single time. I don't want to type in the location every single time. And um, it just makes, makes using the, the APIs much easier. So I can say group equals sticker, sticker, RG. And I can say location equals west, US. Once I do that, I don't have to put, in any, put these uh, in anymore. All right, so now we're ready to go. 
What I need is some place to run this container up in Azure, and I'm gonna use Azure App Service. So I need a Linux box. What I can do is say AZ App Service uh, Plan. Plan is another name for machine. Uh, I can create, and I'm gonna give it a name, and we'll say sticker app plan, and we're gonna say that it is a Linux machine, because that's where we're gonna run our container, and I need to tell it the SKU. And these are all the different SKUs, the different size machines that I can create up in Azure. And uh, since I'm doing a demo and I work at Microsoft, I'm going to use a really big one. So we're going to do an S1 machine. So that's a good one. It'll be nice and quick for us. Uh, sticker RG. Oops. Sticker. What did I do wrong? Sticker app. App. Sticker app RG. Boom. That's good. And now, boom. All right. So that's going. So I'm, now what's doing is it's. It's provisioning out a Linux machine for me. So what we can do is then create the, web, the website to put on there. So we'll say AZ um, web app create, and we'll give it a name. We'll say it's the sticker app, give it some uniqueness. We'll say CDIS, my email, and we'll say the plan to use. I hit control space. Again, I get the app plan that I just created. We'll say put it there, and that's wonderful, and we'll hit uh, command tick, and it'll run that command. Now what this is doing is creating the web app on that Linux box for me, this nice, rich editing experience. And so now once the app is created, um, I have to go and configure it. I want to set a few interesting things on it. So I can come in here again, I say AZ document DB uh, list connection strings. I don't have to worry about spelling it, name, and it'll tell me the, the database, boom. Way easier than when I was typing it from the command line. We'll just copy that thing off. Um, and what I'm going to do is configure a couple things on the website, so AZ web app, config, app settings, which is, like if you've been to the portal, you can do all this stuff at the portal, but since we're using editor, we like to do this here. I can say set a couple things, port equals 3,000. Oh, wait a minute. Set, set, settings. There's a little redundancy there. Port equals 3,000, You can because our container is always listening on port 3,000. And then the other environment variable, MongoDB URL, equals, boom, and uh, that should work. No, I did it again. I always do this. You add the name. They're all laughing at me right now in Switzerland um, and Redmond. So basically what we did was when you set a setting in uh, Azure App Service, a setting will be piped in to the app as an environment variable. So I piped in too. I said, here's the port to listen on, and here's the MongoDB uh, URL to go and, and connect to. All right, so I set those settings, that's all good. Now I just need to tell the web app, hey, use a Docker container. So we'll say AZ web app um, config container, oops, container set the Docker custom image name, Chris Dias sticker app latest. All right, so that's the image that we pushed up to Docker Hub. We'll run that, and it's going to go tell. Oh, I forgot the name again. Name, sticker app. They're all laughing because one of the things we did with the API or the IntelliSense for uh, the Azure command line tool was when you got to a certain point in the command line, we would automatically insert the required parameters, and one of the required parameters is name. And so I said, ah, I was a little aggressive. Let's take that out for now. And every time I do the demo, I forget to put name in. Okay, so what that's doing right now on that machine is doing a Docker pull. It's pulling that image down for Docker Hub, and that's going to take a second, but we'll go AZ web app, browse, and I won't forget the name here. Name, sticker app. If we hit command tick, what this will do is it'll open up a browser pointing at the website that we just created up there, and if all goes well, what will happen is after the Docker pull finishes, and the app gets spun up and it's listening on the proper port and connects to the Mongo database, it will display the page with data. All right. That was pretty good, right? I mean. An editor and a CLI. I've got eight minutes and 47, six seconds left. We're not done, all right? So we've got the data in the, in the cloud, we've got our app in the cloud, or container in the cloud. Same age, we're running locally. Let's just say this isn't enough, and most people would be happy with this, but let's just say that I think that the sticker app is going to be huge, 
and I want to have multiple instances of this, and maybe I've got other containers that I want to run uh, up in the cloud that are part of my system. And to do that, what we need is something called Azure Container Service. And Azure Container Service is probably a talk or 10 talks all on its own. So I'm going to try to summarize Azure Container Service in 30 seconds. And so basically what Azure Container Service is, is a service in Azure which makes it easy to host and run containerized applications. Right? So a container service basically is a cluster of VMs, all managed for you. It, it's got a set of workers. It's got a, you know, in the Kubernetes space, which I'll talk about in a second, it's got a set of workers. It's got a master. If the VM goes down, it'll bring it back up. If one of the containers dies, it'll bring it back up. You can do all sorts of configuration for it. Um, it supports basically open source orchestrators. So Docker Swarm, uh, Kubernetes, which started at Google, is uh, uh, one of the guys that, that uh, worked on Kubernetes, actually works in Azure as an engineering manager now. DCOS, which is Apache Mesos. So all these orchestrators can run inside ACS. And what we're going to do is we're going to use Kubernetes, and you'll see it called K8S. That's a shorthand for it. And by default, it's going to create one master and three workers. And um, we're going to use another CLI. It's called the kubectl, I think is how we pronounce it, kubectl CLI. And I said we were going to do one editor, one image, and one CLI. It wasn't really true. We're going to use two CLIs. But you have to install the kubectl, or you can install the kubectl CLI by using the Azure CLI. So I figure it's like one and a half at that point. So that's basically it in a nutshell. So what we're going to do is we're going to run our app up in Azure App Service, this exact same app. So um, I've got uh, another file over here. It's called ACS. And let me bring it back over here into VS Code. And I'm not going to type all this stuff in. You've seen me type enough today. Um, but here's, here's what we're going to do. We're going to use a different uh, resource group. And basically, a resource group in Azure, um, it defines a unit. It's like metadata. It defines all the resources that you um, that you want to work with in an app. And so we're going to use the sticker app ACS resource group, and we'll set that as a default. Now, here's the command that I ran. I ran this before. It takes six minutes. It does a whole ton of stuff. So six minutes actually isn't, pretty, isn't bad. But it's basically saying, spin me up an ACS um, instance. I want to use Kubernetes. And the name of this thing is stickerapp.cluster. So this thing lives up in the cloud. Um, and the, so that's already provisioned. You can look at it in the portal if you want to. But basically, it's a bunch of VMs, a bunch of network cards, things like that. And the Kubernetes CLI, which is kubectl, so you use the Azure CLI to install that, that CLI. I've already got it installed on my machine. So I can come in here and just say command tick. You can see it's, it's already installed on my machine. Now, what I need to do is I've got this, this cluster that's running up in Azure. And I want this command line to talk to it. And basically, I just have to authenticate between the two of them. It's pretty simple. All I have to do is say AZ Kubernetes get credentials, and that'll go up to the cluster, it'll get some credentials, and it'll pull it down and it'll let kubectl talk to it. And so when I do that, you know, basically I can see that, hey, we're talking to this cluster up in the cloud. Now again, I'm not trying to, I, like, you shouldn't like, hey, let's learn ACS in this. Basically, but I want to show you um, that this is actually real and it's up and running up there. So I'm ready to go, right? I've got a cluster that's created. I can talk to it with my, uh, with my command line. I can actually even run this tool. It's called the kubectl proxy. And this will do a uh, port forwarding of this address up to my cluster. And if I come in here and I say uh, slash UI, this is basically a Kubernetes uh, portal on top of that cluster. If I come in here and I look at uh, nodes, you can see I've got four machines. I've got three agents, three workers, and one master. And that kubectl API is talking to this master. That's where the kubectl API is on the end, on the, uh, the CLI is talking to the API up here. All right, so everything is good. It's up and running. So all we need to do here is we're just going to say, hey, go run me my image that's up in Docker Hub. It uses port 3000. I want three instances of it, right, because we're going to scale this sucker. And then here's the environment variable I'm going to pass in, which is my Mongo connection string. I already copied that off earlier. And that's all I need to do. So I'm going to run this. It'll only take a second. And what this is going to do is it's going to say, hey, go, um, oh, I got to press Control C here. The proxy was still running. Sorry. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. It's going to go say, hey, go create me three instances. And they call it pods and Kubernetes. But go create me three containers uh, uh, using this image from, from 
Docker Hub. So that's cool. But it's just sort of sitting inside this cluster. It's not available to the world. So what I need to do is I say, hey, expose this deployment. Uh, it's, it, it's, see, the deployment's called Sticker App Prod. And what I want to do is go expose that. I expose it to the world on port 80. And it tunnels it into port 3000, which is where my container is listening, and create me an Azure load balancer on top of that. So I'm going to run that, too. All right. Oops. If you select it, it runs what's underneath it. All right, so now what's happening is up in the cloud, my three instances are starting up, and an Azure load balancer is being spun up and put in front of these things. And this will take a minute or two for that to happen. Um, it's not public on the internet yet. If I come in here and I run kubectl get service, you can see that sticker app prod, it's got an internal cluster IP, but there's no IP available to that thing yet. So it's going to take a second to run. So let's just assume, because I only have two minutes left, that that will actually run. And let's just assume that it's running up there, but I actually want to debug, or I want to have a, another instance that I want to connect to. I can go and do that. I can run another instance. We're going to call it a debug version. We'll do the same thing. We'll pass in the Mongo URL to it. And we're going to override the startup, just like we did locally in Docker Compose. We're going to say, run the debug instance and expose that port. So what we can do is just click on that. We'll say, run. Wonderful. We're not going to expose it to the world. What we're going to do is we're going to go get uh, a reference to it. So here's the name of the container running up in the cloud. Copy that out. And I just need to come in here. I'll paste this in. It's going to get awesome in a second. Trust me. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up port forwarding to that instance that's running up in the cloud. So basically, when I talk to port 3000 on my machine, it's going to forward it up to that instance that's running in the cloud. When I talk to port 5858, it's going to put it, uh, tunnel it up into the cloud. So now what I can do is come in here and I can say localhost 3000. And you can see right here that we're actually handling a connection. So this is that debug instance that I've got that's running up in ACS. And I'm just doing port forwarding through it. And so as I sit and refresh, you can see that, well, you can't see it because it's scrolling. Um, but because you know, we're using uh, VS Code and we're using the ability to debug containers, I can come in here and I can say, uh, where my config? Oh, we never did the configuration for doing that. Oh, this is a good way to end then. We're going to do uh, attached to process, attached to remote. So we're going to say localhost, local host. Oh, wait, no, it's container. Sorry. Container. We're going to attach to localhost 5858. And in that container, user source app. So we're going to debug. That container, there it is, running up in Azure Container Service. I need a breakpoint somewhere, so we'll go to Browse and Roots. We'll put that breakpoint there. We'll go back to the browser. We'll refresh this page, and boom. We hit the breakpoint locally attached to that container that's running up in Azure Container Service in Kubernetes Orchestrator, all with a single image a single editor, and a CLI and a half. That's it. So uh, I'm supposed to go through the next. All right, so that's good. Call to action. Get the Insiders build. It's great. It comes out every day. It has new features all the time. Bunch of cool links in here. I think the most important thing, because I have two seconds left, I'm over. Uh, there's two more uh, theater sessions. One is this VS Code, the most useful but underused uh, tips and tricks. That'll be in the theater. That'll be very cool to go and watch. Wade will do that. And then you can get even deeper on debugging configurations with uh, Kenneth uh, at 11 AM tomorrow. Uh, so go check those out. Download Insiders. Get these extensions. I'll have links to the MongoDB extension on a blog post. Hopefully, the guys published the blog post during this talk. So if you go to code.visualstudio.com slash blogs, you'll be able to find, right now it's just a summary roll up. We'll, we'll make it a little bit richer. But you'll be able to find all the links, links to the Margo extension, how to install it. Thank you. Oh, and if you want a, a very tiny sticker for your phone, since you, you know, stayed the whole way through. I forgot all about it. Go back one slide, sir. Yep. Here. Second.